we're also programmed where, you know, if people lose 20%, that's a lot more painful than losing 2% a year for 10 years. Yeah. Uh, it's just how we're, we're kind of, we're, we have, we're designed for like loss aversion. Yeah. Um, and so I, I just think the only way around it is people have to do a lot of um, research and education to see, okay, what do I want to invest in over say a five year period? And what is that gonna look like in inflation adjusted terms, not just nominal term? Bitcoin has dropped 2.4% to $23,909 in recent trading. Macro analyst Lynn Alden issued a stern reminder to those following the daily fluctuations of Bitcoin that we are extremely early by all standards within the past 24 hours. In an interview with Relay Learn Bitcoin, Alden explains that the cryptocurrency has reached maturity thanks to the widespread adoption process. Because of this, we can observe price changes in Bitcoin. However, from a five-year horizon, Bitcoin's potential value becomes clear if one considers the dollar's slow decline. The public's perception of Bitcoin has plummeted since its peak. In the eyes of many industry insiders, Bitcoin is nothing more than a risky investment vehicle. I do think it takes, you know, a couple hundred hours to really mm. get get far enough in that you really know what's going on. And the challenge is, so any anything that seems to the outside like a speculation can become a lot less of a speculation if you are really knowledgeable on that thing. Like, you know, for example, there are deep value stocks that on the on the outside, you know, I, someone will say like, hey, what do you think of this stock? And I look at it and it looks like super risky. And it's like, I'm like, mm. I have no idea. I'd have to spend like... I'd have to spend dozens of hours going into their books. But somebody who has gone into the books and then also researched the industry uh, might end up viewing that as a very low risk investment. They're like, it's super cheap. Uh, the market is mispricing X, Y, and Z. Um, and here's kind of the range of outcomes. And, you know, almost all of them are favorable um, at these price levels. And they can they can develop a thesis for why that makes sense. And so for them, they don't view it as a speculation, even though the a market that hasn't spent at least an hour on it does view it as a speculation. I think Bitcoin's kind of the same way because you have to understand, one, you have to understand money to some extent, which is just not not well understood, the topic of money. Two, you have to understand protocols, right? You have to have some understanding of the history of protocols, um, things like that. You also have to understand some degree of code. Uh, you know, why, why is this different than Dogecoin, for example, right? Mm -hmm. The average person would have trouble explaining the difference that they would say, well, Dogecoin's kind of like Bitcoin, but it also has dogs, so it's better. Um, <laughs> and so basically someone has to go into, well, okay, here's why node size matters. Here's why bandwidth matters. Here, here's why the parameters and the liquidity and the network effect of Bitcoin are, are different than something like a Dogecoin, right? Mm -hmm. And so that, that all, all of those avenues take time. Then you want to go and investigate the risks. Okay, what have been the bugs in the past? What, if, what, what is a hard fork and why are there sometimes different factions in the ecosystem that want to take it in different directions? And you kind of go through, you, you basically should be able to outline all these different avenues. And for a lot of people, when they've done all of that, then they start to view it like a savings technology. Mm -hmm. uh, but even then, they still have to acknowledge risks. They have to obviously acknowledge volatility and say, okay, this is savings technology for you know X percent of my net worth that I can, I can afford to have you know go down by 80% sometimes. Uh, but that I expect to go up long term. Um, mm -hmm. And I do think it's just going to take a lot of time because, you know, something like a cell phone, when it comes out, can can get adopted very quickly. The problem with getting adopted something monetarily is that there's going to be a lot of leverage placed on it. And you're, you're going to get these bubbles inevitably. There's no way to mm -hmm. monetize from zero to 10 trillion. It's right? not going to be like linear. Yeah, it can't be no. linear. Whereas like a technology adoption can be linear uh, or just smoothly exponential, whereas mm -hmm. financial adoption can't be because you can, you can attach leverage to it. And mm -hmm. so you're going to get that. If you haven't, anyone looked at a logarithmic Bitcoin price chart, you're going to get exactly that kind of crazy mm -hmm. uh, higher highs and higher lows, but in a very volatile fashion because you're, you have a technology adoption curve combined with pockets of leverage and euphoria, right? No one like, um, you know, if, if you look at most financial markets, you get euphoria and then you get depression, you get euphoria, depression, whereas you don't get that in, say, like, you know, when smartphones came out and they started to become more and more popular. No one like you know, euphorically gets a smartphone and then it says, oh, this was a terrible choice. And they go back to analog. They go back to the prior phone. Right. And then they go back to smartphone. They don't. It's just more like it's, it's a slow grind into more and more adoption, mm -hmm. whereas you don't get that in something like Bitcoin. And so that's that's inevitably going to be challenging to people. And I think the, the process is that it has to go through multiple cycles. They have to go through the first cycle where they 
they liked it, then they dismissed it, and then they're like, oh, it's dead now, and then it rises again, and then they have another justification for why this time it's not going to be a takeoff, and then it crashes again, and then it goes up a third time, and then they're like, okay, okay clearly I'm missing something, <laughs> and then maybe they'll actually put time into it. I think it's just it has to go through multiple cycles over multiple yeah. years. And I do agree that most people will not understand Bitcoin at a deep level, just like they don't understand the current system at a deep level. Most people, for example, if you pay with a credit card, they can't tell you the complex handshaking that's happening between the banks along the way. How many different how many different entities are involved? Um, you know, just to take the say the four big credit card networks: Visa, Mastercard, Discover, and American Express. Most people don't know the difference. And for example, Visa and Mastercard are not banks; they're just like these technology rails that banks issue cards on. Whereas uh, Discover and American Express are banks, and they're also these payment rails, mm -hmm. right? And then and then. You know, you have basically acquiring banks, you have, there's so many different like handshaking aspects for how that works, let alone if you go into like repo markets, like basically how how's fee, uh, you know, working at the wholesale level, basically between banks and things like that. It, it's just a very complex market. I, I remember like there's this crazy diagram that shows how the dollar system works between the Fed and all these things. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it almost looks like a, like an Ethereum roadmap, you know, like this, this crazy, it's like this Rube Goldberg machine. And, and, it, and I remember, I think I tweeted something like, uh, you know, this, this whole dollar thing is like way too complex. Like, uh, yeah. give me Bitcoin instead. And it's, it's one of those things, like if you had to just learn the dollar system from the root, from scratch, and someone was like trying to sell you this idea, it would take a lot of time to spin up um, on that. And so I do think basically Bitcoin only has to be understood by the, the marginal that will then shift over. And then it, once it hits critical mass, it's just like, well, okay, this other thing's devaluing and this thing's not devaluing. And so, it just kind of works itself out over time. Mm. Onto the prior point, um, so I, I don't I don't set out to trade. Um, I you know for, for Bitcoin I dollar cost average in. I think that's how the, the majority of people should consider doing it. Basically, mm. just determine what allocation makes sense to you, mm -hmm. um, and and just kind of stick with it and, and have like say a five plus year view. Mm. Uh, you know, preferably longer, but I know realistically like you know a five year thesis for what what this kind of is, is playing out. Um, you know, for, for portfolio management, because I do, you know, I provide a lot of investing research. Um, I focus on this full time. And generally what I'll do is if something is becoming very euphoric or it's become a very oversized allocation of the portfolio, um, I will I will generally trim that. Um, and so, you know, when I have, say, securities that are proxies for Bitcoin, maybe they're Bitcoin mining stocks, maybe they're, mm -hmm. mi maybe they're MicroStrategy, maybe they're one of the ETFs or trusts that hold Bitcoin. If I'm if I'm doing that in a, specifically in a portfolio context, and let's say I have five percent of the portfolio in them, and then they go up to fifteen percent of the portfolio because they they've gone exponential mm -hmm. in like an eighteen month period, um, what I've done in the past, like during this prior bull run, I said, okay, it's getting euphoric out there. Dogecoin's going vertical. Uh, this is this is tripled in the interest of my asset allocation, so I am going to sell into the strength, and basically, you know, lock in the you know the gains you've made mm -hmm. because that allows us to then maybe redeploy. Uh, when now we're like in a bear market. And so mm -hmm. I do um, risk management in that regard because I do have, you know, a lot of people reading the research and they don't want to be caught off by, you know, massive drawdowns. And, mm -hmm. you know, I never try to predict, okay, here's the top, here's the bottom, let's actively trade this. It's more like, depending on if it's euphoric or depressed, if it's way above kind of like, uh, you know, like uh, volatility adjusted price bands or, or mm -hmm. below them, I kind of just make note of that and I say, well, okay, when it's euphoric like this, the probable range of future returns is now diminished over, mm -hmm. say, a two, three year period. Whereas if it's super cheap, it's okay. Now the probable range of future returns is, is better. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I do manage the volatility in that sense. Mm -hmm. But I, I, for example, I never touch cold storage Bitcoin. That's a, that's a different animal. What are your thoughts on Lynn Alden's ideas in this situation? Do you think that within the next five years, Bitcoin will become a common form of investment? Leave a comment if you found the content to be helpful. Please take a moment to consider making a contribution to our channel by clicking the thanks button located below. Guys, that's all I have for you today. We'll see you in the next one.